Welcome to First Baptist Church of Elkin, a community of faith that seeks to love, live, grow, and go like Jesus. Regardless of who you are or where you've been, everyone is welcome, really. If this is your first time with us, we feel honored that you would choose to worship here today. After the service, we would love to meet you out on the front lawn and answer any questions that you may have about the church. We would also like to extend a warm welcome to our Facebook viewers. Though we wish that you could be with us, we are so thankful that you could join us online. If this is your first time viewing the service, then please let us know in the comment section below. Here are a few things that you need to know this week. Please mark your calendars for our next church conference this coming Wednesday, October the 26th at 6.30 p.m. in the chapel. We will vote on proposals from the Finance Committee as well as the Building Committee. Our annual Trunk or Treat will be held on October the 31st from 5.30 to 7.30 here at the church. We will have trunks with plenty of candy, a free dinner, a bounce house, and pumpkin painting. Please spread the word and invite your neighbors and friends. This event is open to the public and we hope to see you there. We're currently collecting non-perishable food items for our Blessings in a Backpack program. Donations will be collected throughout the month of October and will go to the Elkin City Schools children who are in need. Thank you so much for participating. If you have an announcement that needs to be shared in next week's Need to Know, then please email me by Tuesday of this week. God bless and welcome to worship.
Let us pray. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Much we need thy tender care. In thy pleasant pastures feed us. For our use thy foals prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast taught us thine we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast taught us thine we are. Amen. Would you join me in the responsive reading, please? Though the way seems long and the road rough, yet will we trust the one who leads us. Though the direction is unknown and we don't know the outcome, yet will we place our lives in Christ's loving care. It is Christ who brings us out to green pastures and restores our souls. It is Christ who gives us hope and peace. Praise be to Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand now and join me if you're able in our call to worship, hymn 62, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. And at this time, kids can come down for kids' time. have any boys here this morning. Raise your hand if you know what you call this room. What do you call it? <laughs> well, Lily, right? 
uh, Elizabeth raised her hand, but we talked about it this morning, so tell them what this room is called. Do you remember? <laughs> she remembered it, but she forgot. It happens to me all the time. This room is actually called the sanctuary. But for as long as I can remember, with my kids and I, we've always called it big church. Do y'all do that too? But sanctuary means a holy place. And so big church, especially during this time, becomes a holy place. Learning to come to big church is really hard, isn't it? It's called church, but then it's called big church because it's where adults go, and then adults teach their kids to say that. That's right. You're exactly right. But learning to come to big church can be a challenge. Look what I have in this bag. I have a Bible. I have a sketchbook, I have my Sunday school lesson, and in the bottom I have tissues, crayons, pencils, and some snacks. And that's kind of how I settle my kids when we're here. But, and this stuff kind of keeps everybody less antsy. So our church has decided that when you're six, you're old enough to come to big church. Now, if uh, parents want to bring their children when they're younger, that, that's fine. But sometimes at six, it's a challenge because Elizabeth came down the aisle one day from uh, kids' time, and she looked at me, and she says, boring. And, and it wasn't that the kids' time was boring. She just didn't want to sit back there. She wanted to go to the nursery with her brothers. And so that's been a challenge you, you can't see it because you're looking this way and I'm sitting in the back, but I stand up and I'm going like this, but sometimes she still <laughs> slips off. Um, but coming to big church is like anything else you want to do. When you think you're big enough to sit two rows up from your parents with your friend who's come to the movies with you. Sometimes that's even hard for parents. They want you to sit right where they can touch you or... And maybe getting to go to your first sleepover, it's a big challenge for parents to let you go, but that's part of growing up. And how about having a cell phone? We hear it all the time. All the kids in my classroom have a cell phone but me. But sometimes you just have to practice being big enough, right? Who's big enough? Some things I've learned over the years with my children and grandchildren and now my great-grandchildren is that I'd rather sit with a child in church and miss half of the sermon because I'm trying to quieten them down than not have them growing up in church. I'd rather let them draw color and even sleep on the bench than not have them beside me. And I love the surprise when we get in the car and somebody says, are we going to go to Bible school? Can we go to Jingle Jam? Because they've paid enough attention to know those events are coming up. But the one that surprised me the most just recently was Elizabeth asked me, what is baptism? The day that we had the baptism. And she kind of perked up wanting to know. That, that was a different thing that she had observed in church. I'm going to tell you a joke. Many years ago when I went to that other church, we had a, a minister who almost always told a joke. And my oldest granddaughter was with me in church, and she had stretched out on the pew, just really wanting to take a little nap. And the preacher started the joke, and it said, a Presbyterian minister, a Baptist minister, and Jesus were going to play golf. And Jade sits up suddenly, and she says, Jesus played golf? So, so what I have learned that even through osmosis, I guess, kids hear and remember and talk about those things when they're in here at, at kids' time and in church sitting beside their parents. Isn't that called selective hearing? Do what? Isn't that called selective hearing? <laughs> I'm sorry, does it what? 
Well, she says, is that selective hearing? Yeah, probably. <laughs> well, honey, adults and children also uh, suffer from selective hearing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we've come today together to learn about our church, to learn about Jesus and all the things that we can do in your name. Help these children, even with their selective hearing, to pick out the right things to remember, the right things to practice, and the right way to love each other. Amen. Thank you, ladies. Please stand and join me in our hymn of praise, hymn 212, I Love You, Lord. Please join me in our prayers of the people. God, you are the autumn artist painting the living masterpiece of vibrant colors and golden light outside our doors. Delighting in your glorious canvas, we pause from the fullness of the week. We seek even briefly to break free of the push and pull that marks each second of the day. We remember the sacred and ordinary moments that mold our hearts with your love and grace. The kindness that comforts the breathtaking melody that reaches our ears. The warmth and shelter of family and friends and the joy of discovering new ways of living and being as the people you created us to be. For God's world, the concerns of this world are numerous. We become speechless with the weight of tragedy and injustice. We pray for peace among nations and individuals. We pray for coal miners and their loved ones in Turkey. We pray for the victims of mass shootings in Virginia, North Carolina, Georgia, Texas, and California. We pray for the hungry and unhoused as colder weather arrives. We pray for the therapists, doctors, and counselors working tirelessly in the midst of a mental health crisis. These are a small portion of the needs of the world which we bring to you, holy God, who sustains and renews all things, trusting in your unfailing love and your mercy which endures forever. Have mercy, O God. For our church, we pray for receptive bodies, minds, and spirits, that we may receive the nourishment you offer, reaching toward the sun, soaking in the rain, rooting ourselves deep into the soil where we find ourselves planted so that we may contribute with full vitality to the habitats and communities to which we belong. We thank you for our church's many blessings and may we continue to share those blessings with others. 
Have mercy, O God. For our community, this morning we gather as your community, knowing that as individuals we entered this worship space, whether in person or virtually, from vastly different places. Knowing that our community is an array of your creation, may we and all those who gather to worship in your name be a safe and loving place for all. Have mercy, O God. For our loved ones, we name in our hearts those who await healing and strength to endure the trials they face when illness and loss, injury and discord, grief and unexpected events wear us thin, draw us close to one another and close to you. Make a way for the inbreaking of hope and the breath to say, bless the Lord, O my soul. Have mercy, O God. We pray, God, for the strength and courage and wisdom to grow where you have planted us and to join you in your creative healing and life-giving ministry. We pray together now as you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Would you pray with me, please? The chill of autumn, the beauty of the trees, and the blue of the skies remind us, O oh Lord, of your majesty and your love and grace toward us. You, O oh Lord, are worthy of our worship and praise. Now as we offer to you from our being and our abundance, Lord, please accept our offerings as praise and worship and love for you and to further your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Alleluia. Amen. I will be reading from the King James uh, Version of the Bible, and I will be reading uh, uh, John 10, 1 through 10. Verily, verily, 
I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus to them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. These are a gift from God. Thanks Thanks be to God. Thank you very much, Ms. Cox, for reading. Thank you for being a part of this service and for all who have uh, planned it, Lance and the choir, and uh, keep looking back there. They're not there. <laughs> You're out there. But uh, there's, a, there's a very worshipful spirit here that, uh, that I sense. Would you bow with me? <clears throat> Lord, we do thank you for this day. For everyone who is here, for those who've planned it and prepared the way this service is laid out, for all who've led and all who participate, and even others who are not here who are uh, participating online, and those who are praying for us, and we thank you for the assurance that you are present with us. It's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. I don't watch an enormous amount of TV, but when I do watch it, I often become frustrated with commercials. Does that ever happen to you? For one thing, there are just too many of them. One of the other things that's frustrating to me is that uh, so often the commercial itself seems to have no connection with the product that they're advertising. They just get your attention and then tell you what they're selling you. But every now and then, there is a commercial that uh, that I like or that at least amuses me, at least the first few times I see it. And one comes to mind that I've not seen recently, but uh, it it, it sticks in my mind. A man goes into his kitchen and opens his refrigerator door. He reaches in and takes out a carton of milk, and I see a few heads nod, you remember this one. And he opens it and he is about to take a drink directly out of carton. What he doesn't see is that his wife is standing by watching. And just as he gets it to his mouth, she whistles. He's startled and he spills the milk all over himself. But then the next scene shows outside their house, their driveway comes right beside it, their car is parked there. And a suspicious looking man is approaching their car. He has some kind of tool in his hand. It's obvious he has come to break in. 
And just as he approaches the car, the security system whistles sounds just like the wife's whistle. And he puts the tool up and he quickly leaves. You see, he's come to the wrong place for the wrong reason. Now, that connects with me in some way to what Jesus is saying. He speaks here, he said, uh, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. He's come to the wrong place for the wrong reason. Now, the context of this, of course, is back in chapter 9 that we looked at last week. Because in that passage, Jesus healed a man who had been born blind. Remember, Jesus spit on the ground and mixed the saliva with a little bit of dirt, made some mud, smeared it on his eyes and told him to go to the pool of Siloam and wash. He did and received his sight. Now being able to see, he goes back to where he has been a beggar and people there recognize him. They say, hey, hey, is that really you? Can, can you see? Yes. Well, how did that happen? And he tells them, Jesus. Well, they are delighted, joyful, thankful. And they think the religious leaders ought to know about it. So they take him to some Pharisees. <clears throat> now, remember the Pharisees are some of the leaders who are very legalistic, very negative, and they already have Jesus on their list. They want to get rid of him. And for Jesus to heal a man who had been blind from birth gives more credit to Jesus, and they want to somehow cancel that out. So instead of rejoicing at what God has done through Jesus by giving sight to this blind man, they start nitpicking. They said Jesus is a terrible sinner because he did this miracle of healing on the Sabbath day. And they go back and forth, and you remember the story about that. And at one place, one of the lines that I really love is where they're trying to get this man who's received his sight to condemn Jesus as a sinner. And the man says, well, I don't know about all that. All I know is I was blind, but now I see. And you may remember that's a part of one of our great old hymns. Um, <clears throat> these are people who refuse to accept that Jesus is the Christ. Instead, they, they're people who are trying to undermine him. And so Jesus said they're thieves and robbers. They're climbing in the wrong way. Now, there, there's another background that goes way back that we need to see, and that's in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, religious leaders and political leaders are often referred to as shepherds. Because just as a shepherd is supposed to look out for the needs of the sheep, so the leaders are supposed to be looking out for the needs of ordinary people. But there are a lot of these shepherds, they're leaders, both religious and political, who instead of trying to meet the needs of people, are only exploiting them for themselves. And uh, that's in the prophets several times, in Jeremiah and Zechariah. And, and there's a particularly graphic chapter, Ezekiel chapter 34. When you get home, you may want to read that, where he goes into great detail about this, how they literally exploit the people for themselves. Jesus is saying, you know, if you don't climb in the right way, then you're thieves and robbers. But the scripture says that the people didn't understand what he was saying. <clears throat> and so Jesus changes the imagery a little bit there in verse 7. Jesus said, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Now there's some scholars, William Barclay being one of them, who tells us that Jesus may be talking about one kind of sheep pen in verses 1 through 5 and a different sheep pen in verses 7 through, through 9. Look at that first one. <clears throat> uh, there were in the villages and in the towns community sheep pens. In other words, there may be several people, several families in that village who own sheep. They shepherd them themselves or they hire shepherds. And there is this sheep pen and they have someone who is a night watchman and a gatekeeper. And so at the end of the day, the various shepherds would bring their sheep into this pen. It might be two flocks, it might be ten flocks, but anyway, they're brought and 
the gate is closed and locked, and that gatekeeper is the watchman who watches after them. The next morning, the shepherds come, and the gatekeeper recognizes them. He knows they are legitimate shepherds. And so he opens the gate, and the sheep come out and follow the shepherds. One of the questions that, that comes to my mind is, how in the world do you divide those sheep to be sure that they go with the right shepherd? Well, you don't divide them. They divide themselves. Jesus talks about the sheep recognize my voice. Shepherds have distinct calls and distinct voices. Think about it. Some of you have dogs. If you've been gone and you come home and you call to your dog, that dog recognizes your voice and comes out so glad to see you. But if a stranger comes and maybe calls the dog even by name, your dog doesn't recognize that voice and he may, uh, he may pull back or he may even bark at the stranger. These shepherds each had their distinct call and their distinct voices, and so the gatekeeper would recognize that these are legitimate shepherds, would open the gate, the sheep would come out, and the shepherds would go in different directions, and they would call their sheep, and their sheep would follow them, and they'd go grazing, then come back that night. But beginning in, uh, in verse 7, he could be talking about a different kind of sheep pen. <clears throat> You see, when the weather was mild, the shepherds would take the sheep and they would go to some pasture to graze. But the weather was pretty good and maybe there was better grazing somewhere else and they might not come home that night. They might go from pasture to pasture and they might be gone several days. And so shepherds over the years had built some rustic sheep pens out on the hillsides. The walls were probably made out of rocks piled up, but instead of a door that would swing on a hinge like they had back in the village, they would just leave an opening. And the shepherd would herd his sheep into that pen and then lie down across the opening to sleep. The shepherd literally became the door. So if a sheep in the middle of the night decided he wanted to wander around and was going to go out, He'd have to climb over the shepherd, which would wake him up. And so that was, that was the security. Um, so Jesus says, I am the door. I am the door. Verse 7, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. What Jesus is saying is, I am the door to access to a relationship with God. The Pharisees claimed that they were. Oh, if you obey all of our rules and regulations and do all these things just right, you dot the I's and cross the T's, then you, know, you, you come through us and listen to us and we, we'll get you in relationship with God. Jesus is saying, no. I am the doorway to a relationship with God. I am the way to salvation. I am the door through whom we go for eternal life. God has offered through Jesus Christ the gift of grace. And through Jesus Christ, we come into that relationship with God. It's not the institutional church. It's not the pastor. It's not the priest. It's not a group of deacons or whoever that controls our relationship with God. It is through Jesus Christ that we come into relationship with God. Now that connects us with something else. It goes back into history. In the 1500s, King Henry VIII was king of England. And uh, the Church of England was still at that point a part of the Roman Catholic Church. There had been the Reformation, the Germans and some others they had been breaking away. But the Church of England was still a part of that. But King Henry decided there's some things he wanted to do, and we won't get into that, and he had to have permission of the church, and they said no. So King Henry said, well, then I'm the head of the church. So he pulled the Church of England out of the Roman Catholic Church and established himself saying, I am the head of the church. Now what that meant was, he and whoever he appointed controlled everything. And that went on, not only through him, but in other kings that followed him. So it was the king and his people who would tell you what to believe, 
who would control how you worshiped. And on and on we could go. But of course, there were some people who disagreed with that. Now, uh, th that disagreement, that discontent would increase. And one of the factors that uh, had a part in that was the translation of the Bible into English. Uh, that was just forbidden. They had the, the Latin Bible and the common people couldn't read it for themselves. But a man by the name of William Tyndall began to translate the Bible. He translated different parts. He traveled around. But for translating the Bible into English, he was burned to the stake, at the stake. And they said that William Tyndall's dying prayer was, God opened the King of England's eyes. Imagine, burned at the stake for translating the Bible into the language of the people. But over time, there would be more openness to that. Uh, King James Version, which uh, Mrs. Cox read from, uh, officially was uh, in 1611. Um, there were others, though, who translated. But again, there was, there was a whole lot of control. But there were some people who became discontent with the king and others controlling everything, and especially as they could read the Bible and discover more and more what Christianity was all about for themselves. Two men uh, who were called separatists, uh, Thomas Helwes and John Smith, took a group called separatists over to Holland. And there, where they had religious freedom, they could read the Bible, they could study for themselves, they met with others from other countries, and began to come to a conclusion about what Christianity was all about according to Scripture. Well, uh, about uh, 1612, I think it was, Thomas Helwes went back to England, took a group with him. They established a church just outside of London at a place called Spitalfield that is still recognized as the first Baptist church on English soil. But Thomas Helwes did something drastic. He wrote a paper, they called it a treatise, in which he summarized their convictions of what the faith was really all about. And he wrote a personal letter to King James. And in essence, what he said was, the king has no authority over the relationship between a person and their God. The relationship between a person and God is between God and that person. Did you know that he was arrested and put in prison where he stayed until he died in 1616? Jesus says, I am the door. It is not the king, the president, it's not anybody else. That relationship is between an individual and God through Jesus Christ. And I'd remind you, we can be thankful for our First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States that says Congress shall not pass any law regarding the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. We have religious freedom and often take for granted that, uh, that a lot of places don't have that. So Jesus said, I'm the door. That relationship with God is through Jesus. But notice something else he says. There in verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. In and out is an expression of everyday life. The sheep came out of their pen in the morning and went out to pasture. Uh, think about the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Jesus said, it is through me that you go in and out of everyday life. Does that mean that if we trust Jesus, then everything's going to be smooth and easy with never a problem? No. Think about those early disciples and early other followers of Jesus. Many of them went through some very difficult times. Life has its joys and it has its sorrows. We have some good times and we have some tough times. Some of you have experienced suffering and grief and illness and, and different things. No, there's no promise of Jesus that we will not have tough times, but the promise is he is with us. Again, go back to the 23rd Psalm. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. 
I'll go to the Gospel of John in verse 14, that wonderful passage where Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples. He's been trying to prepare them for the fact that he is going to die physically. He will leave them, and they're distraught. But down in verse 18, he says, uh, I will not leave you alone. It's interesting to know that that word that's translated alone in the Greek is a word that means orphan, Orpheus. I'm not going to leave you like abandoned orphans. I'm going to come to you. And then there's the Gospel of Matthew, the last verse. Remember, it's there that Jesus gives to his disciples. He, he is the resurrected Lord. He's about to ascend. But he gives them what we call the Great Commission. Go you therefore and make disciples of all nations. And he concludes that by saying, Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the age. Jesus promises. He is the doorway through whom we have salvation, we have forgiveness of sins, we have hope for eternity. But it's not just a matter of life after death. It is also his presence with us in the here and now to strengthen us and to get us through. Sometimes we go through dark times and wonder, how am I going to make it? And sometimes it's only later when we look back and say, you know, the Lord must have been with me. He got me through this difficult time. But then there's something else here. In verse 10, Jesus said, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and might have it abundantly. Life abundantly. Again, in the 23rd Psalm, there's a saying, My cup runneth over. What does it mean if your coffee cup runs over? Well, you got too much coffee in it. Well, that sounds like quantity, but of course in the 23rd Psalm and also here, he's not talking so much about quantity, he's talking about quality. He's talking about real life. We as human beings have all kinds of needs and drives. We get hungry, we get tired, we, you know, there's this, that, and the other, and that's all a part of how we're made. But we also are spiritual beings. We have a part of us, really essentially all of us, really needs to be related to God. But there is that dimension of us that while the physical life comes to an end, something continues for eternity. And that spiritual dimension is here, and we need to cultivate it here and now. Jesus says, I am the one through whom you cultivate that life. This is where you get it. In human life, and I think particularly in our culture, our society here in America today, we are caught up in more and more possessions, more and more entertainment, more and more this, that, and the other. Uh, again, go back to commercials. Uh, there'll be a commercial that says that this automobile, it is the greatest in the world. Man, if you just buy and drive this one, you will have it made. Of course, five minutes later, there may be another commercial for a different brand. You know, that comes up too. Are, are, are there those uh, commercials that tell us, oh, if you just go on this cruise, if you just go on this vacation, if you just go to this place, oh, life's going to be wonderful. Or those who say, hey, we'll, we'll manage your money for you, your, your wealth management. You know, just, just trust us with it. And one of the things we realize is nobody has any guarantees. I remember hearing my mother and father talk about the Great Depression. They were just ordinary, poor people growing up, and life was tough for them anyway, but it was tougher. But even those who had the most, many of them came crashing down. Some of us can remember 2008 and 2009, the Great Recession. It sure changed things, and there's an uncertainty about the economy today. We don't know for sure. There are no guarantees. But there is that other thing, that it's not possessions. It's not pleasures, it's not activity or entertainment that is going to give us the real life. We need that spiritual life that only God can give us and he gives it through Jesus Christ. I am the door, Jesus says. I am the door to the relationship with God, which includes forgiveness and life eternal. I'm the door through whom we have the presence of God with us in everyday life to lead us and guide us and strengthen us. And he is also the door 
who gives us the essence of quality of what life really is, what really matters, what really counts. A missionary that impressed me long ago was uh, one long before any of us were here, and that was David Livingston, who was a missionary in Africa back when that was called the Dark Continent. He spent much of his adult life in Africa. He went through some difficult times, but one of the most difficult was that while he was there, his wife died. They said he prepared her body for burial. He helped to build a coffin with his own hands. He helped to dig the grave with his own hands, and then he conducted the funeral. They said that as he came to the close of the funeral, he said, I want to read you one more passage. And it went back to one we mentioned earlier at the end of uh, Matthew's gospel. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. He read that, and then he looked up at them, and he said, our God is a gentleman of the strictest honor. He always keeps his promise. Let us be going. Jesus is the door through whom we have relationship with God, our salvation, forgiveness of sin, eternal life. He is the door through whom we experience the strength and the presence and the guidance of God. He is the one who gives us real life. He is a gentleman of the strictest honor. He always keeps his promise. Let us trust him. Would you bow with me? Lord, as we reflect on these familiar sayings of Jesus, we pray for your spirit to lead us, not so much to hear the words of the preacher, but that we would hear your voice speaking in our hearts, not only today, but day by day as we seek to follow you and to trust you. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. As we sing our final hymn, uh, pay attention to what God is saying to you individually, personally. And if there is a public decision, then I'll be down front to receive you. But uh, whatever that may be, here and now, would you listen to what God is saying to you? Hymn 285.
thank you for being a part of worship today. This is a warm and friendly congregation, and I want to remind you, if uh, you see somebody that you don't know, uh, give them a welcome. It may be a fellow member, but it might be a visitor, and uh, speak to one another and uh, share a greeting. Would you bow with me? May the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain in you always. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Let's do you.